Right. Understood about occultism. He was a friend of Aleister Crowley. He wanted to use Crowley, you know, to fight the Nazis during World War II. I mean, the the interplay between secret societies and secret agents and intelligence operations, that's another whole subject for another whole conversation. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, something you touch on uh, in, in Sinister Forces a bit. I mean, you almost get this image, that we're, the sense that we're not that far removed from days when kings had uh, magicians and wizards on, on either side of a battle, on the you know, casting spells on their enemies. We are uh, not that far at all. We are right there, my friend. Yeah, we are right there. Uh, just a couple more questions because I know we've we've already skipped through an hour with hardly the blink of an eye. But uh, one of the favorite whipping boys of critics of Freemasons is General Albert Pike, yeah. and you can find the copy. Uh, you can find Morals and Dogma online and read it. It's it's dense. It's tough to get through, but there are certain key phrases and paragraphs that he's written that jump out uh, his praise of Lucifer as the light bearer, for one thing. Uh, what influence does Pike have on Freemasonry today? Well, in terms of Scottish Rite, Pike is the godfather. There's a statue to Pike in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. uh, so Pike is considered to be, you know, the person who brought it all together, who figured out all the connections and who created an entire... Uh, mythology, if you will, of Freemasonry. Yeah, not too if many, look, not too many Confederate generals who have statues in Washington D.C. Exactly. In fact, I think he's the only one. I believe he is. Yeah. Yes. Now he's been blamed, and I think, you know, the the jury's still out on this one because I haven't seen documentation to prove it. But he's been blamed for having been involved in the creation of the Ku Klux Klan, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons he's a whipping boy too. Is that he's connected with the Klan. Um, he was a bit of a racist. I mean, in some of his writings, it's there. He had uh, serious reservations about bringing uh, African Americans into Freemasonry and wrote a letter to somebody saying, well, if that happens, you might as well close down the temples or something. So he was, he, he was a racist, you know, to a certain point. He was a Confederate general. Mm -hmm. But he used, he had no problem with Native Americans. No, I, I know. He led uh, a, a military units comprised of uh, Ch Cherokee or Choctaw uh, That's dur right. during the war. Yeah. That's right. So he had no problem there. He had a problem with African Americans only, <laughs> which reminds me of that blazing saddle scene, you know, where they say, okay, you know, we'll take the blacks and the Chinese, but not the Irish. That's right, right. It's just it's ridiculous stuff. But anyway, that's what we have with, with, with Pike. He was a fascinating guy. He was obviously very well read, a very astute person. He spoke many languages. His intelligence, I think, is beyond doubt. Uh, Morals and Dogma has absolutely the best index I have ever seen in my life for any book. Uh, every single page is indexed in there. You can look up any phrase, any any word, and find it. And for those who have a copy of it, look up Lucifer, and you'll find his statement about Lucifer. Mm -hmm. well, to be to be honest, the word Lucifer is Latin, and it does mean the bearer of light. Yes, um, yeah. uh, that's a Lucifer. Um, uh, you know, yeah, that's what it means. He was the son of the morning, according to to some. You know, um, Lucifer. The word I think Lucifer does not appear itself. In the Bible, because it is Latin. After Transla all, yeah. yeah, translated from the Hebrew Hillel, H E L E L, which, yeah, means right. essentially light bringer. Yeah, light bringer. So, uh, the idea was that there was a falling. He was a falling star. That he was a meteor or something that fell from heaven, fell from grace, brought the light with him. Um, and Pike goes on about that a little bit, and people use that as a way to demonize all of Freemasonry. Well, in the first place, Pike was writing in the late 19th century. Um, so, you know, Freemasonry existed for hundreds of years before that. I don't think Pike was revealing a secret about Freemasonry so much as wishful thinking, maybe, on Pike's part, or trying to show a relationship there. But at the same time uh, that Pike is writing about this, or a little bit later, we have Madame Blavatsky, uh, who creates the Theosophical Society, who starts a magazine called Lucifer. Mm. Okay, so, and she would not have considered herself a Satanist by any stretch of the imagination. But there's a kind of, how shall I put it, a kind of uh, Satanic element in this, in that we're going to use the word Lucifer because we know it irritates a lot of people. <laughs> we know we're going to get attention, and it's going to irritate them, and the people that we're going to irritate are people we want to irritate. So, so let let it let it be. You know, let it uh, let the the chips fall where they may. A little bit like Anton Lavey and the Church of Satan. I think LeVay was basically an atheist, but he wanted to use the word Satan as a publicity angle mm -hmm. and to identify anything that was uh, counterculture uh, against the government, uh, against organized religion, and use Satan as the, the name that he put on top of it. So, you know, there's an element of that in Pike, 
and in uh, in Blavatsky, I think there was this idea: we're going to use this word. You know, we're going to shake things up a little bit. Yeah, similar to going into Fenway Park with a Yankees cap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Except that might be a little bit more dangerous. More dangerous, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have read Dan Brown's novel, The Lost Symbol, and the Freemasons are, are treated very well. They are portrayed as noble defenders of uh, a, 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 a truth that will be revealed to mankind in order to save us when um, our, our, when we're at our darkest hour, facing global extermination, something like you know the legend of King Arthur coming back to save Britain in its hour of dire need. Right. Um, what is your, your what is your problem with Dan Brown? <laughs> um, okay, problem number one was uh, the Da Vinci Code. Um, I was a person who had read and devoured all of the writings of uh, uh, of Bajent and Lincoln and Layback when they wrote Holy Blood, Holy Grail. Mm-hmm. Uh, and when I started to read, I, I had read Angels and Demons first, which was actually the, the book he wrote first of that series. And I thought Angels and Demons wasn't bad; it was okay. Better a book. Hope. A better book. Yeah. When I got to Da Vinci Code, I was number one appalled by the writing. I thought his his writing had deteriorated. I mean, I couldn't. It was unreadable to me. Mm-hmm. But then when I got a, th- a few couple of uh, chapters in, I mean, the the plot was telegraphed to me because I had read Holy Blood, Holy Grail. This book turned out to be a kind of novelization of that, mm-hmm. and I felt that there was really no reason for me to keep reading. You know that it was done, and then the movie version they made of Angels and Demons uh, was so totally historically bollocked up. Mm-hmm. It was such a mess that it showed a contempt for the audience that was unbelievable. You know, uh, the Illuminati were not around with Galileo. All right. The Illuminati and the Catholic Church were never at odds because the Illuminati didn't last that long. They were mm-hmm. suppressed, you know, quite quite early on. They might have been considered a problem in France during the French Revolution, but then so was everybody. So I don't think that, you know, I think that Brown was being uh, dishonest with the facts. You know, he, he he sort of picks and chooses from here and there. And he he tries to present, he wants to have his cake and eat it too. He wants to demonize the Illuminati, defend the church to a certain extent. And then he wants to write a book where he's defending Freemasonry. And we know the church is a sworn enemy of Freemasonry. And mm-hmm. you know, uh, when uh, Pope John Paul I was elected, one of the first things he wanted to do was to get the Freemasons out of the Vatican. And he died 33 days later. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, you know, I just, I, I will not follow that up with any obvious remarks. But so we have this situation where. It's a little dishonest what's happening. It looks as though Brown is just trying to write a pop boiler, and he's not being uh, honest with with the facts. He's not either. He's not doing the research, or he just throws it out. You know, when it doesn't suit his plot. Well, you and I see eye to eye on that because there were some other issues I had with the Da Vinci Code that uh, anyone who'd taken Western Civ should have spotted right away. I, for, well, for example, I would have I, I would have enjoyed the book more if he had made uh, the Emperor Theodosius, who was actually the emperor who made Christianity the official religion of the empire the uh, the 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 guy who sort of created christianity whole cloth yes i still don't buy it but at least it would have made more sense than putting it all on constantine but again right right uh, yeah you're right and the lost symbol is very formulaic same basic thing except uh the villain isn't uh, an albino monk this time he's uh well, he's actually a crowleyite uh, so anyway oh my god oh well yeah there we go uh, so well, it, it, fascinating, and, and I look forward to reading the Secret Temple to uh, to get into it. And again, I know we've only scratched the surface, but in the interest of uh, you know making this a reasonable link for those who've uh, uh, downloaded this podcast, uh, we, we will close it here. Again, the Secret Temple: Masons, Mysteries, and the Founding of America by Peter Lavenda, published by Continuum, available through Amazon.com or any other online bookstore. And uh, uh, as we've said before, we highly recommend Peter's other writings: Unholy Alliance, The Sinister Forces uh, Set, and uh, uh, again, add uh, the Secret Temple to that uh, that wish list with Christmas on the way. Uh, maybe a time to add that to your library. There you go, uh, Peter. So again, appreciate your time, appreciate your research and uh, and your writings, and uh, as always, a fascinating conversation. Thanks very much, Derek. Hope to do it again soon. A link to the Amazon page for Peter's book, The Secret Temple, will be in the show notes at pidradio.com, and we recommend following the link there to uh, his other books, especially. Sinister Forces, the three-volume set, which might well be called The Six Degrees of Charlie Manson. Uh, Essentially, there's more going on than meets the eye in Washington, D.C., and it's not all tied to the Freemasons. 
If you've got comments or questions for us, you can reach us a couple of different ways. Send us email at radio at peeringintodarkness.com. That's radio at peeringintodarkness.com. Or you can call us. Leave us a message. We've got a 24-7 voicemail line for your comments, questions, and guest suggestions. That number is country code one three one seven four eight nine nine three five zero. And you'll find that number posted at PIDradio.com. Next week, we'll take another look at the symbolism in Washington, D.C. and what it might mean for our future. Our guest, Tom Horn, about his new book, Apollyon Rising 2012. That's next week. Until then, I'm Derek Gilbert. Thanks for listening. This is A View from the Bunker. (laughs) 